think all we can say about our league form of, of late and results is that it's been very, very disappointing. No, no doubt. Let me, let me finish. No, no, about that. And I'll put all the figures here. You're right. We were we were fifth last year. We were fourth the year before. We were fourth the year before that. We were first the year before that. We were third the year before that. We were fourth the year before that. It's very, very disappointing. I mean, I, I, I could say, you know, you know, there are. But not, there are other examples of disappointing results. The uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, which most people consider as the premier club in you know, America, hasn't won a championship for 50 years. The Blown Sharks, who are the best support team in Germany, have won one championship in the last 21 years. Um, don't you worry that we spend, and I spend my day worrying about it, because I can tell you, if you think it's something that we just think, oh, it doesn't make any difference to us, of course it does, because we're going to have a crowd here tonight there would be half the crowd it would have been if we were ch challenging for the league. We're going to have a pretty rubbishy crowd probably on Sunday, and we've got all, every single home game is going to be disastrous. So I can assure you 100% that the number one thing that we're interested in every single season is how we do in the league. And, it, and if there's some kind of thought process that it doesn't, that we've got some sort of disinterest, then I can just say that that's just. Yeah, you know, incorrect information. Um, the question is, the question is, in my mind, is, you know, why are we doing so badly? Yeah, that's the question that we try to address every single year. You know, why are we doing badly in the league? And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give it back to you, and, and you tell me, in your mind, why we're doing so badly in the league, and what you would do about it. My, my second question following on from that would be, in, in the light of, of our league record, why have we had the same coach for the last eight years? Um, the, other, the, the reason for it, I believe, is that we all look at ourselves, we all do our bit by turning up, week in, week out. Yes, it was a sellout against Coventry. I mean, who gets a sellout against Coventry? Albeit there were, goodness knows how many hundreds of GM, free tickets to the GMB, that's why it was a sellout. Mr. Moran will now be believed he's done a brilliant job and look, I've sold out my arena. What he doesn't do is selling out the free tickets to be given away for that game. As far as I can see, as, look, the league, yeah. As, why, we need to win the league. We need to win the league because, because these people turn up every week. Sorry. So, so just like we could all look at the terms. Okay. So, number one, the reason why we don't win the league, you say, is the coach. No, that's what I just told you. Right. Okay. Okay. okay, so, and I'll ask you, okay, so that's the coach, and, and what would you, just out of interest, because this has got four, I'm going to hear what you do, and what would you do to make us better? I would change the character. Change the coach. Um, I'm not fond of the general manager. Um, but I, I, I don't believe we, we spend, if I would be very interested to see figures, I don't suppose we will ever see them. But financially, we must be head and shoulders above any other team in this league. How do, how do we get beat by a team from Fife, by a team from Edinburgh, and various other teams, if beyond me? Now, let's take, for instance, Cardiff. Their arena only holds 3,000. They can sell out every game of the year. No, they don't pay for the arena. Whereas ours cost is whatever it is, 12, 13 grand, 14 grand a game. But our, our average crowd now is almost 6,000. Our profits must be huge compared to theirs. I would love to see the percentage spend team by team. And if every team spends the equivalent percentage I don't believe any other team in this league would live with us. Right, well, let, let, I'll try to deal with a few of those points, but I'll, 
I don't really, this is not the suitable forum to discuss, I think, you know, whether you like the coach or someone doesn't like the coach, you know. Uh, the reality is, you know, he's won 12 trophies since 2010. So, you know, we're on, you know, he's the most successful coach in the history of the league. He's the most successful coach in the history of the Northern Panthers. And, and so we're with that. But let's, let's talk the specifics of the league. Just so, you know, because I think there's a, a bit of a misunderstanding. Because, first of all, um, just in terms of who manages what, so we just understand this completely, the off ice team is completely separate from the on ice team. So we have nothing to do with who we recruit, which players are available, not available, etc., etc. That is completely and utterly down to the on ice team, which is obviously headed by the coach and his assistants. And they manage that process in its entirety. In, in terms of our budget, I would actually say that we are head and shoulders above any other team and what we spend. I would be shocked if there was any other team in the league that probably spent as much money as we do on players. It's not what you spend, unfortunately, it's how you spend it. Okay? And absolutely, no, I, I'm, I'm just saying that it's, it's not what you spend. So, so the reason for doing poorly in the league, and like I gave examples of the Maple Leafs, you know, they, they must be having this conversation 50 years in a row, spending the cap before anyone yet yeah, even started. I mean, you know, we can, you know, whether it's a shakar, we can speak with lots of people. So the key is, unfortunately for us in the league, is, is there's some, we seem to have a disconnect at the moment between the league and winning some other things, because we're incredibly successful in winning some other things. And when it comes to big time one-off games, we've got the most unbelievable record in our coach, who's never lost the final. It's just the most astonishing thing. And if we were probably playing in a structure of pure playoff hockey, yeah, we wouldn't be having this conversation because nobody would give a toss when you finish fifth in the league or fourth in the league because we'd be winning the big trophy every season or every other year by the end of it. So the problem that I, me looking in as a fan, is I have to just can't work out necessarily why we seem to be doing so poorly in the league. You have, you have, a, coach, you have a coach who believes it's not his job to motivate his players. Now, if you're going to end on a wet Wednesday night, those players probably need motivated. If they're turning up to play the semi-final of the Challenge Cup against Sheffield, they probably don't need motivated. So. I would say that we strive to do better in the league, for sure. Um, why our form in the league has been very disappointing is, you, you may say it's to do with motivation, I don't know, it may be to do with the fact uh, that we don't travel as far as it is. It may well be the fact that we actually travel in considerably greater luxury than other teams. Um, there are all different things to look at. I've been accused, I, I hear, you know, that we mean we don't let the team stay the night before. Well, whenever we stay the night before, we've lost the game. We've virtually got a 100% record of staying the night before and losing games. Okay? Because the reality, just on that topic, because people say, oh, why didn't you stay the night before, Carvis? Oh, then you win the game the next day. Well, we did. You know, okay? Yeah. Okay, really that, okay, right. But you know, it's the general kind of go to Scotland, go to Scotland, we do, we stay the night before. Okay? But, so the point is, is the principle. Like saying, well, if the players have nothing to do the day of the game, the coach doesn't want them to sit around doing nothing because here they're practicing, they're in a routine. So we look at all these factors. Our, our league form is unbelievably disappointing. I can tell you it's the number one topic of discussion uh, in the sort of Panthers senior management all the time. But it, okay? it's, it's not perceived like that now. When, Ten years ago, all the earth out was winning the league. Um, that, that, that was our priority. So Absolutely not true at all. Our priority, let me say, our priority is to win the league, for sure. Hundred percent that's our priority. If we win the league, you know, all these other issues were in Europe, they'll deal with themselves. 
the league is the priority of this club. And fiscally, it's incredibly important for this club because if you're doing as poorly as we're doing now, you end up with a whole series of games that are, you know, I wouldn't call them meaningless, but let's say that we all wish they were much more important games than they currently are. Um, so it's totally in our interest. We were in exactly the same interest to think of these. So if anyone thinks that, it's just you know, misinformation. Can we ask why then, if the Evening Post article was fake, was it not pulled from the claw that that wasn't true? Because, uh, I, I, well, first of all, I can say, you know, I, I left the, you know, I don't want to get too involved with the, the guys involved in the yeah. post. Okay? But, you know, I may know that as far as I was concerned, you know, comments that were attributed in that particular article were completely you know, incorrect. But by, by, no, by saying nothing, you're accepting what the guy's written. I, I appreciate what you say. I think you're wrong. You don't need to watch the dirty linen and public. But it, it, if somebody broke the screen and attributed it to me, in print in a newspaper, I walk around in print in a newspaper and I'll put my side down for it. If you don't, which people are going to assume, you say. Look, all I can say is the league is the priority for this club without a shadow of a doubt. Yes, it's quite nice. Of course, it is winning the Challenge Cup or winning the, the playoffs. I mean, you know, especially not when it's not being at the playoffs. Um, and of course, winning the Continental Cup is, you know, a very major accomplishment for this club. And obviously, in terms of the profile, it gives us, obviously, gives us a place in Europe next year. It's an exceedingly important tool because it's going to allow us to recruit much better players um, more easily. So it's very important for us, and that's exactly why I believe it's important for us as well because it helps us recruit them. But I can categorically tell you now that the league is our number one priority this year and every other year. So, and so what we're doing next year is different than to make it, you know. Well, that that we're looking at now because there's no doubt about it that this is. Uh, very disappointing. I mean, without doubt, we have to look at our recruitment policy, for sure, because um, one of the problems we seem to have had at the moment, and it goes back to what the gentleman asked about fitness and stuff, is, you know, we, we seem to be having a major problem with injuries. Injuries seem to be um, very prevalent in our club. And we need to maybe definitely reassess the sort of players that we're recruiting um, in order to do our best to reduce the probability of injury. Why should I buy a seat? Why should I buy a seat? Well, that, that's your that's your choice. Well, okay. There's a lot okay. Of I, I come on. You know, all, all I can say is, you know, we do our best to put on a, a top product. You know, we've got a terrific team this year. I can categorically tell you that we've never had a team anywhere near the cost of what this team costs now in terms of the talent pool we've got. Look at, if you make a comparison, because it's easy to forget what things used to be like, yeah? Because it's easy to sort of just let's forget it. But let's just talk about our team today, almost as compared to the team that won the Grand Slam. The team that won the Grand Slam had 10 imports. We started that season with 15 players, yeah? Uh, we didn't play any games at all that season with more than 18 players. Okay? This season we've got, I think, 17 imports in our team. We've got more players than we've ever had. You know, last year was the biggest roster we've ever, a team's ever had in the league. Um, it's not that we're not trying. I mean, unfortunately, we see to hit a very bad run of luck with injuries. Um, and that's really derailed our, certainly our league challenge this year. And, and it also do well our league challenge certainly last year. Um, what we need to reassess without a shadow of doubt is we cannot afford to be recruiting players who are injury prone. Um, because the problem now is that it's very difficult to replace players. And that has checked, that's actually been a considerable change over the last couple of years because the player pool in Europe is considerably diminished from what it used to be for two or three reasons. Uh, that some of you may be aware of it. One of the major leagues that we used to source players from has folded. 
in the CHL. Um, there are a number of teams in countries in Europe now that have more imports themselves, so they've taken up some of the pool of players. The actual minimum pay and pay levels in the US leagues has increased considerably in the last couple of years, and obviously Sterling is currently through the floor. So the idea that you could just pluck a player out of East Coast Hockey League and he'd come and play at Nottingham and he'd have a 50% pay increase just doesn't happen anymore. So the player pool is considerably reduced and it's making it very difficult to reduce players in season and therefore we've got to be even more clever with our recruitment at the start of the season because if you get an injury, we're stuck. And this year, unfortunately, we, we had a, you know, a series of, you know, I'm saying, sports situations with a couple of our imports, obviously one of them was father got very ill, so we had to go home, that was unlucky. We had another one with Sam, you know, deciding to a career change, so that affected our British situation. Um, and then we had some players just picked up all four injuries, and we all know who's still on that list. Okay, let's just, let's have a slightly different topic. Cheers. Um, my question is around youth development. Oh, sorry, my name's Anton. Uh, my question is around youth development. Um, in the past, Corey's been known to bring in one, two, three of the younger Lions players, for instance, training with the club, sitting on the bench and what have you. Um, is there any thoughts of the Panthers looking to establish a proper link between the NIH, or whatever it's called nowadays, um, the EPL and then the Elite League, with, say, the Lions, Sutton, Sting, and the Phantoms? Just three names out of the top of here. I would say that the situation with junior hockey is disastrous in, in this country at the moment. Um, there are, unfortunately, we, we have no involvement really in players until they're sort of um, 16 plus, let's just say. We can't get involved in players younger than that. Um, and the number of young players coming through, not just in Nottingham, but across the whole country, is a diminishing number. And there's a whole series of issues to do with that. There's obviously the cost of taking on the game, which is very expensive. Um, ice time is expensive. Most of the buildings are under some sort of um, financial pressure to make sure they charge as much you know, where they can for ice. Um, and the alternatives for young kids to play some other sports is much cheaper and easier. Rugby, obviously, football. You know, hockey, whatever the sports are they want to take up. So what we need really is some sort of strategy from, to be honest, the governing body, because it's their responsibility to do with junior hockey, um, to do with getting people at a much younger age uh, to learn to skate, to getting people um, learning ice hockey at a much younger age. So when they come to us, potentially at 15 or 16, they are players that Corey can hopefully uh, bring on, or in the past bring on, bring on. The problem is that, and I know we've done that time to say, but this league is now at the highest level of standards probably been, I've been doing this 20 years, and we're at the half level we've ever been. This league's never been better. So unfortunately, this is quite a difficult environment for young kids to come in and basically just sort of learn, because it's you know, if we're using golf as my favourite analogy, you know, we've got a team of plus two handicap golfers. And if you just chuck in an eight handicapper, he's just going to be outplayed. And the problem is the juniors coming through are generally eight handicaps. And what we need is to have scratch juniors being given to us so we can easily turn them into plus two. And the other problem, going back to what this gentleman said, is when you hear what these gentlemen said about obviously the pressure for a coach every single game to win. There is absolutely no chance whatsoever that our coach, nor would I wish him to, is going to just chuck people on the ice to play in very tight games just because they need to have five or ten minutes of ice time. It's not our job as the Panthers, nor is it what the fans expect for us to be some kind of a development league. So we have got some quite difficult issues because we're not the development league. We're playing every game to hopefully win. Unfortunately, no, we're not. But we're trying to win every game. And there's no there's no one game because of the league structure. It's not you know it's not like the playoff where you can maybe just change your players around a bit and even get your goalie in or your third goalie and give them a bit of a warm up. Every game counts in our league. So it's quite difficult. There are also um, 
very prohibitive rules about players going down and coming back up, which is very unsatisfactory because what would be an ideal system of these would be for young players to be able to train with us in the league. We could send them to some of these teams to play games on the weekends, they get better, and they can train with us. And if maybe we're short of a few players, we call them up, send them down. The problem is, you can't easily do this because they have their own rules to stop players moving freely up and down. And all these leagues below us all think that we've got some ulterior motive to send in players to make them win games and then they come back up. So they've all got their own rules in place to stop that happening and it, it's not ideal. Um, but I can assure you absolutely that we are very, very, very interested in junior development because we know we need better young players coming into our ranks. And unfortunately, most of those better players seem to be going abroad to learn their hockey. That seems to be what happens at the moment. Most people are having a great personal expense to send their kids abroad uh, to learn hockey. Um, it's a very unsatisfactory situation. And what we really need is a coherent policy from the governing body and from the support, we certainly have the support of the media teams to get a much better junior hockey system. When I say junior, I'm not talking about under 18s or even under maybe under 16s, but I'm talking about juniors. 12, 14s, that's the kind of age. Because if you're going to be a good player, using my golf analogy, you're going to be a scratch handicap by the time you're 12 or 13, or you're never going to be a professional golfer. And we need to get much better juniors at that age. How have Sheffield gone away with it then? Sorry. What you're saying about players not being able to move up and back down, how have Sheffield got away with it with Liam Kirk and Cole Shooter? Yeah. No, no, you, sorry. You can have some players going up and down, but they've got these, they've got some rules about if you uh, release them, etc. It's not so straightforward. And we, we have our players going up and down ourselves. But the system's not ideal because what we really want to do is just loan players at the weekend to teams to play games rather than maybe sit and do nothing and then be able to just call them up but they've got this thing of like, I can't remember the exact number of days if they go down they can't come back up for a number of days it's 30 days they've got these rules um, you know quite clearly one of the problems for juniors is the fact that we want the standard this league to be as fast as possible that's the truth of it I mean like I said we're, you know the standard of the product now is really high well, the reason we won the Commonwealth Cup is because the league's never been better. Uh, that's the reason. And the reason the league's never been better is because right across the board, all games, the standard is very high. There are no games. I mean, you know, years ago, maybe the last season, there were blowouts. You could win a game, I don't know, double figures. Ah, uh, yeah, one, oh, fine. You could put your goal in for a good period and a half. You could put all, you know, the juniors out. They could play. Well, Bar us with an 8 on Cardiff, I, I, I mean, it's been a, you know, I don't reckon it's been a blowout whole thing. I don't know, people probably know better than me. Most of the games are very close, and that has made it quite difficult to encourage, um, let's just say, keep players to go in pressure situations. Cool, sorry. It's all right, I'm Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Because there are a lot of preventable injuries yeah, the, since the league win. The gentleman asked that was the first question. Yeah, we absolutely are looking for um, strength and conditioning and off ice. And Corey has somebody at the moment who he works with the team. They do have a strengthening coach. Um, but again, it's not, I, you know, I'm not involved you know, in, in the off ice, but absolutely. Injuries is a serious issue here for the sport, um, and, and it's you know it's something we definitely need to address. Okay, my name is Andrew. Um, the fact that owners are part of the committee and chairman of a league kind of makes it out to be almost a beer league. Kind of you expect. To new owners of the club 
not have any major decisions in how leagues run. I'm not, I'm not too sure what you mean. You mean the fact that we, we all have... Yeah, oh, the chairman of the league. Chairman of the league. Yeah. How can that? Yeah. You can't be fair for the rest of the clubs well, in the league. I, I hear what you're saying about... Tony, you mean about the chairman of the league being the, the ownership club? Well, as it happens, it's, it's not an ideal situation, and Tony, more than anyone else, you know, knows it's not an ideal situation. The problem, the problem is at the moment is the... We need to find maybe and we and have any discussion and we'll turn this into a suitable, neutral, non neutral chairman. The problem is, it's actually very difficult in such a small community of fans to not end up finding people who end up being connected to one club or another. Um, because that tends to be the history of the fan base in the UK. So you end up with someone who's either involved in Nottingham or is involved in Sheffield or involved in Cardiff. Um, Tony does a very, very good job. Um, the actual, well look, I, I can assure you he does, the league is very, very democratic, it, it's one club, one vote, um, you know, he, he merely just chairs the meetings and he's our representative at Ice Hockey UK, um, he more than anybody else would love uh, there to be an alternative chairman who's willing to do it voluntarily and um, it's a hell of a lot of work That's and it's a hell of a lot of responsibility. You can't then back. That's the that's one direction, Belfast. You can't then back your team and start stating another team or pulling out the picture and then cry to the league because Cardiff refusing to move again. So I, again. I said you can't ask for a rule change, which meant that their game against Coventry, Sheffield's game against Coventry, wasn't allowed to be moved. And now the well, well, he was entitled to ask for it, you just didn't get it. But they, I mean, he asked for it, and it, and it, and it was declined because we have a rule since One Direction uh, situation to protect fans. So we brought in a rule specifically for the benefit of fans to make sure that no club can move a game um, at less than one month's notice that these fans know that the game's you know going ahead, etc., etc. Um, unless there was some obviously you know, force majeure, or whatever, they have to come to the board now to get their approval. Uh, I believe he came to the board and very quickly worked out to move it. That, case, that worked, to me, that worked fine. If that's the case, then surely you shouldn't be allowed to then go and publicise it. Well, that's up to the... I, I don't know what they... Ah, sorry. I, 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 didn't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it All I know is I couldn't move it because we have good rules in the league. We have good governance. It's democratic and, you know, whether, I, whether they wanted to move or not, they couldn't. Which is good for facts. Yeah. Uh, Max, um, you, you said that you need one person to come in as a, an individual uh, chairman. Uh, one person is given their, um, their name forward already. What was what you what are your thoughts on that? What, is, what he has said? Have you heard any? What, what he said? Sorry, you're saying that. Well, it's new to me. I mean, fine. I mean, I don't know what he submitted his CV or whatever. But obviously, he needs to say, he, he, sorry, he's coming to be the chairman of the elite. Yeah, the elite he, he put, he put uh, Okay, well, if he, you know, I'm sure if he circulates the elite, we would, they would consider it. I mean, I have no idea about Brock's, you know, credentials and where he lives and day to day, but, you know, if he's serious about being, you know, what's out his name before, I'm sure he'd be well considered by all the other clubs. I don't know. I, I, fine. I mean, is, that, is that the way that the league needs to go to... I think, having an, I think having an independent chairman of the league is a good idea. And I can guarantee you that the current chairman agrees with that. <laughs> but like I said, we have to, we have to find a chairman who was willing to do what is a very time-consuming job uh, at the moment. It's on a voluntary basis, um, and we would only really look to find a new chairman who is similarly impartial and not connected with any other club. So, like I said, it's not so easy to find them. Uh, Obviously, we might be happy with Brock Wilson, but other clubs might um, suggest something different. Mm -hmm.
but he should uh, send his email to the elite league. I would suggest he's uh, see you know, his proposal. Mark, with the expansion, the new clubs coming in next season. What's your view on the conference system? Okay, so well, okay. Uh, okay, well, um, you know, as people know, I, I just, I'm just trying to work out what other, you know, what we're not going to say or not say. But obviously, the league is hoping to expand next year um, to 12 teams, not 10. Um, I'm pretty confident we will be. Um, and in order to just work, make it all work, I think unfortunately the conference system is probably going to have to stay, but it would be two conferences of six, because we're been looking at alternative scenarios, and there's no easy scenario that gives us the sort of number of league games that we've currently got. Um, there's no perfect solution. At least if we went to two conferences of six, there would be less disparity in terms of the number of games played cross-conference and inter-conference because it would require three games home and away in your own conference and two home and away against the other team. Um, what, sorry, the second part of the question was about this... Well, would the, conference, would the teams in the conferences stay the same or with the view that the two that are looking to come in are down south, are we looking at the same teams in the same conferences? Well, I'd say one of the teams would have to, I, I would strongly suggest just looking at the geography of this. <laughs> um, I would strongly suggest looking at the geography and the, uh, the nation, let's say, involved, that um, it would be a strange scenario if the two new teams which were based in South didn't sort of feel more inclined to play with, let's just say, more the English clubs. And the uh, one of the teams that obviously doesn't fit in so well geographically as that conference would probably make sense to be in the other conference. Um, that's what I would imagine uh, would be a very likely um, scenario. Um, there's pluses and minuses putting my uh, hand this out on. Of course, it, you know, uh, you can spend all day long working about who gets an advantage game-wise over that or not. But I think that would be the only way. It, it's not actually very easy to solve this scenario of I mean, both Nottingham um, and a couple of other clubs are very, very keen on all the clubs playing the same number of games each against each other. Uh, the snag is, when you get to 12, it's not an easy number to work this out, because unfortunately, if we were to play each other three times, that's going to involve 33 home games. Well, that's a crazy number to fit in, considering we're struggling at the moment to fit in 26. Um, so 33 home games creates, let's just say, lots of difficulties. Um, plus, of course, you know, all the other games can involve loads more potential for injuries, etc. So we're not a fan of 33 league games. Uh, then the next scenario is 22 league games. Well, we're also not much of a scenario 22 league games because then you have to fill the games up with non-league games, and it's our feeling that league games are the most competitive and and valuable of, of all the games that people want to watch. So, so there aren't a lot of easy scenarios. It will be a lot easier, hopefully, when we get to 14 teams and we can blow everyone twice over the way. Would, would 22 games give you room to have an extended and more meaningful playoff scenario? Because at the moment, the playoffs are just a couple of games that might win. Yeah, I, might yeah I, I, I take that point as well. Um, I quite, I would, we would, we are very in favour of an extended playoff scenario, and that's going to be looked at for next year, I'd say for sure, for next season, season 17, 18, because playing a best two legs, two leg game, is not a great scenario, even though sometimes it's, it's worked in our favour, you can win the whole playoffs for that one in one game. Well, never win a playoff again. Absolutely, yeah. like, 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 we, like we had with Rusty. Um, so, yeah. I agree with you. The, the problem you have is again, you go down, it comes down to scheduling. It comes down to the fact that a few of the clubs, including ourselves, have great difficulties booking dates at that time of year. So if you end up with lots of games and you didn't know the club, you, you don't know the dates, you don't know who you're playing. Um, 
it creates unfortunately schedule issues. Uh, well, you've got but, 27 games now, haven't you? Yeah, but what I'm saying is we do the scheduling. The, the fixtures meeting takes place in June, and all the dates are fixed. So what happens is we, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, you know, we get, we, you know, we get our calendar from the NIC effectively in June for the pitchers meeting, we have an agreement that they can change a couple of games while they give us notice. Um, problem is, I would hate to be going into the playoffs and having booked one date and then be sitting there having a conversation in sort of, let's just say the end of March, about uh, we've got to fit in, I don't know, five playoff games, let's say, in an arena that we don't control, that I guarantee we'll be booked solid in April, uh, we just won't be able to play it, basically. I mean, we, we know how difficult it is for ourselves, I mean, it was only a few years ago we had to play a Challenge Cup final, as you remember, after, was it after the playoff quarter, I think it was after the playoff quarter finals. Um, the problem is, to be honest, it's the arena clubs, including ourselves, who end up with the most difficulty in organising this. I would say that there is a bit of momentum, at least towards the concept of a best of three um, playoff quarter final, let's say. Um, where everyone is trying to uh, work towards that as a minimum. But again, that gives logistical issues because when you have a team like Belfast involved in this scenario, and you ended up like, I think we had it last year, um, when you end up having to start booking flights at one day's notice, because you may have a game three against Belfast, and you might be here at Nottingham, game three might be back in Belfast, uh, that isn't so easy to organise either, unless you've got your own aeroplane. Um, so, you know, there are issues. I think all of us would agree the playoff format needs somewhat um, beefing up, let's just say. Yeah. But 
that's a very fair comment, Gemma. I, I mean, I, the only thing I can remember we actually did was this is the old the little bobby there a few years ago. Um, but that's a good point. It will be discussed at tomorrow's Panthers management meeting. Anybody got the other? Any other questions? How are we doing with the time? Hold oh, on, I wrote it. Go on. Anyone got? Anyone want to? Have we got a couple more? Anyone want to fire off any more general stuff? Anything specifically? Tonight's game. I don't know. Go ahead. Just one about recruitment sorry, for the Champions Hockey League. Um, are we going to be looking to recruit players that will um, help us do as well as we possibly can do in that environment and then actually stay with us after we finish the Champions Hockey League games? Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. Um, for sure we're going to be recruiting the same players for the Champions Hockey League that will certainly run through for the whole season. A absolutely. Um, and obviously the Champions Hockey League, just for a bit of background, it's, it's changing the format, um, but it's going back to format sort of we had. The Champions Hockey League will be 32 teams, there will be eight groups of four, the games are starting, the games sort of, I think slightly later, um, but again they're at sort of end of August. Um, draw is May 17, I think it is. Um, and then it's uh, the top two in each group go into the last 16. Um, and it's um, something that we're going to try to do our best. I mean, you know, but like I said to this gentleman, our goal is the lead. I mean, well, realistically, you know, what's going to happen to Champions Hockey League? We ain't going to win it. So we've got to recruit a team that's going to do well in the league. And with a bit of luck, you know, we might be able to perform. Obviously, last year, last time we played Champions Hockey League, we were wrong one game out of six. I would say our goal would hopefully be to do better than last year, but that's just going to be six games and we're going to have probably 54 games in the league to worry about. So we need to definitely recruit players with a 100% with a view to being with us for the whole season. Good. Any more questions? Okay, go on. What? Yeah, well, I've got to put my piece of paper on me, but I've got it somewhere. Yeah, I mean, training camp is even earlier this, uh, this uh, next, this season, sorry, season 17, 18. I can't remember the date now, but uh, the training camp, I think, is starting on August the 7th. Um, so the first, yes, yeah, so they're in earlier. So we have three weeks, we have, I'm doing off the top of my head now, I think 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, I think 7 to 11 is training camp. This is the plan. 7 to 11, if I've got the dates right. Mon if Monday is the 7th of August, then it starts training camp that week, then we'll be playing, uh, hopefully, um, be able to organise some pretty high profile opposition to come to play us on the weekend of 12, 13. Then effectively we'll have another week of training camp and we'll have another series of friendly games the following weekend. And then the following week, um, the Champions Hockey League I think starts on a Thursday. It's the first game, depends on the fixtures. So we would have hopefully had, and I would also be insisting, um, without wishing to interfere, but I would be insisting that all players who want to play for the Nottingham Panthers are available for the start of training camp. Um, and then we can, you know, whether that means we lose certain players, too bad. But um, you know, we, we need to start, you know, sort of running, you know, and and hopefully with the games that we play. Yes, I mean it is more games, and it obviously has a bit of wear and tear. But we'll probably have you know a few extra, you know, for these to take account of that. But the idea should be that the time we start the league campaign, you know, we've had, we've had 10 unbelievably good games under our belt, and we should be, you know, absolutely off to the races when we start the season. Um, and that would be our expectation, because I think we badly need to get off to a good start um, to really get the momentum going. So that's the plan. Final question.
from what end of the front? What players have got contracts for next year? Uh, what players have got contracts for next year? Um, I would say the pro I'm, I'm now taking just off the top of my head, so I'm just. I would say that probably most of our British players are on the contract for next year already, and certainly uh, we've got one, of, I think maybe one or two imports maximum, excluding those about to start their second year of Loughborough University. Um, who are? Uh, now you're testing me, and I don't want to do it, obviously, because our competitors like those under contract, but I think off the top of my